Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Caffeinated Bible. It's so good to have all of you here. Today is a really interesting day. This is the first day of the series, the Caffeinated Bible Espresso, and I'm glad you're here. Now, the goal of the Caffeinated Bible Espresso is to take just short shots and really look at particular issues that help you interpret the Bible. Today, I'm gonna to go through the number one rule I share with all my students in my biblical interpretation and New Testament classes. You don't need any books, tools, or anything like that to do this, and you can do it anywhere at any time. really simple and easy to remember. Context, context, context. So I'm going to put a timer up down here with three minutes on it and we're going to see if we can stick within that time frame. Okay, so let's practice this so you can remember it. It's context, context, context. Okay, you can do better. You need to repeat with me. Ready? Say it out loud. Context, context, context. And finally, it really helps if you make the hand signs. I learned this teaching in Latin America. So let's, you know, put the smartphone down on the side there. You can tell, hey Siri, you know, wait for me or Alexa, pause, but let's do this. Ready? Context, context, context. So I'm sure you've all been in these situations where you're hearing someone teach or you read something on a biblical passage and then you look at it and you go, I'm not quite sure it means that. So this little rule will help you determine if they've got an appropriate reading of the text or not. While you may not get it, the exact precise meaning of a text that you're hoping for, it will get you a long way down the road towards that. And finally, if you practice this, when someone asks you a question and you apply this rule, you're gonna sound like a genius. Now the challenge that we face today as contemporary readers is that when we pick up our Bibles, it's all compiled into one text in one language and it presents itself as sort of a unified whole to us. The Bible was written over the course of more than a thousand years on three different continents in at least three different languages by over 40 different authors. So you've got cultural, linguistic, geographical, and historical changes all taking place as you read through the scriptures. So context, context, context stands for three questions. What does this author mean in this text with these words. And a good example of how things change culturally is when we were in England, my wife walked up to a tall gentleman in church and asked him where he bought his pants because she was having a hard time finding clothes for me while we were there. And without batting an eye, he replied that he buys his pants at Marks and Spencer's and his trousers at Harrods. Now, the thing you need to realize is that in the United States, these are pants. In the UK, these are trousers. Pants are what's underneath our trousers. Different languages, different contexts, different cultures, different historical periods. So we need to keep that in mind and just ask that question of context. How does it change or how does it inform this text? And then we need to ask the question about how is this word used in this passage? Because the meaning of a word is not locked in. It really depends on the context in which it's used. So let me give you a couple of examples here of the word date. My favorite fruit to eat is a date. Sam took Sally out on a date. What date were you born on? And not to date myself, but when I was a kid, the telephone was screwed into the wall. And finally, context, context, context can often help you interpret a passage that you may not have studied before or even interpret a word that you may not know the precise meaning for. It'll get you a long way down the line. So for example, if I use the word expectation, idea of, come on, I know you're there, just, just reply, answer my text message, will you? And hopefully this particular video has not been unlightening to you but has really helped you understand what I'm talking about with context, context, context. 
So if you like this video, be sure to share it with other people and give it a thumbs up. If you can think up a great verb or noun to explain this idea of giving a thumb up, put it in the comments down below this video. I would like to hear how you are able to take a new word within this context and linguistically invent something. Peace. So for example, with regard to what does this word mean in this context, oftentimes you'll hear people say that agape, one of the Greek words that's translated for love in the New Testament, means God's unconditional love. Now agape can mean everything from having warm affections to someone, to cherishing someone, to really loving them affectionately, to even just kind of giving them a warm brotherly type embrace, like a hug. It has a wide range of meanings. The problem here is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul takes this very generic word for love, agape, and he loads it full of theological meaning in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now Paul's view of agape then is defined by that chapter and it's different than other New Testament authors. In the Gospel of John, John likes to use the words phileo, which we often translate as brotherly love, and agape almost interchangeably between the two words. So for example, in John 5.20, Jesus says that the Father loves phileos, the Son, and shows him all things that he is doing. And then in John 16.27, he says, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. And he's using the word phileo there. And finally, we come down to the famous passage in John chapter 20, where Jesus approaches Peter on the Sea of Galilee. And he asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Now, the first two times, Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I phileo you. The third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter is upset because he's asked him three times so far. And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And then Jesus says, feed my sheep. All too often I've heard people teach this passage and they say that Jesus is questioning Peter if he agapes, loves him unconditionally. And Peter's not able to rise to that. He can only love him at a human level, phileo. And this is why Jesus then condescends in the very end and says, Peter, do you phileo me? In John's gospel, John doesn't have the same differentiation or the loaded theological meaning that Paul does. It's a different author using the words in a different context with a particular meaning in mind. And I think in particular, the reason why Jesus asked him three times and why John tells us that Peter was upset that he asked him the third time is because Peter has denied him three times. So it's not that Jesus is condescending to Peter's level, rather it's a restitution of Peter. You denied me three times, now we're gonna have you confess that you love me three times. Mm -hmm.